Warning, the following podcast features views and opinions that are likely to trigger the extreme fanboys and fangirls who disagree with them. Listener discretion is advised. The end game was upon us. We were there, we saw it, we did it, we made it. There was a while there where I thought, I'm never going to get to see this movie. It's just taking way too long. You, you didn't sleep. I, because the, you were waiting the for this night, movie. The night before, I had a very hard time sleeping, and I think I woke up at like 5.30 or 6 the next morning. Yeah, no, this is unusual amount of excitement. So I'm bringing that excitement back today. We, myself and Mrs. Business, hello. Hello. Uh, we did a whole two, almost three-hour podcast it was a long time it was a really long time i'm we, surprised that people listened <laughs> a lot of people listened if so if you listen thank you very much but a lot of you were asking are you going to do a follow-up now that avengers endgame is in theaters you guys have seen it you guys did your rankings where does avengers endgame uh hold up in in your entire ranking system i feel like it's time that we finally i think I think it goes without saying, but we'll say it anyways. We can talk about this movie and there's going to be spoilers. There's going to be massive spoilers. Yes. So please turn it off if you have not seen Endgame. Also, what have you been doing? This is like, if you haven't seen Endgame yet, this is like, this is now cross Titanic on the all time worldwide list. I mean, you're kind of a loser. You're kind of like lame. Yeah. (laughs) Um, By the way. If you uh, if you hear any weird jostling, we're just laying in bed right now. Yeah. I don't think I could ever do this with any other podcast guest. By the way, I like the the podcasting in bed though. It's it's very it's very relaxing. I feel like I could only do this with you and maybe Ken Napzok, and that's about it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you wouldn't do it with anyone else besides him and Ken, me and Ken. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Uh, so Avengers Endgame. Now that the, I don't want to say the hype has died down because it hasn't died down. No. But now that, you know, pretty much everyone's seen it, we've had all these discussions. I literally was saying every day for about two months, 29 more days till Endgame. Yeah. 15 more days till Endgame. Pretty obnoxious, I have to say. (laughs) But But you always knew when it was coming out, right? (laughs) I mean, I, I understand it's, it really was as grand of an ending as I think people expected it to be. And I mean, were you disappointed with the countdown? (laughs) No, (laughs) like I just remember driving to the theater. I was like, I almost like didn't want to talk. I was like, I just, I, I, I have nothing left to add to this world until I see this movie. I mean, not, I, I know you get a lot more excited about this stuff than I do. And it's not that I wasn't excited. I just, I didn't want to get my hopes up. Sure. You know, I mean, I I knew it was going to be great, but I also don't want to be on this high and then be like, oh, that's not what I was expecting. So I'm glad I just like stayed neutral until I saw it. I mean, a lot of times and I talk about this a lot on the show, some of these movies that come out are what I call like victims of circumstance, where it's just like sometimes a move. I think a perfect example would be something like Justice League or Solo, where it's like the expectations for what that film was going to be killed it before the movie even came out. Something like Avengers Endgame, we were going into it and it was like overwhelmingly positive. Like people, critics saying it was like the greatest Marvel movie. One of the greatest, uh, the word culmination was used in every single review I saw of 22 movies. So it's like, it was almost impossible for me to go in not thinking this was going to be the best thing that ever happened to me, except our wedding. But (laughs) um, I remember sitting there as it ended, and I was like, I, I don't think I would have changed a single thing in that movie. No, I think they wrapped everything up perfectly. And the things that were really at the very end, I mean, you said spoilers already. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just the way they ended it with Cap and Iron Man, I'm like, perfect. Yeah, I mean, Done. I think, you know, they we knew it was going to be mainly like a goodbye to those original Avengers. Which I was sad about, but I understand. But in some ways, I feel like it was a new beginning for some of them. Like, let's talk about Thor specifically, because there's a lot of chat. A lot of people either love what they did with Thor or are not happy with Fat Thor. Where do you land on Fat Thor? I am pro Fat Thor. Um, I can understand why people 
didn't like it. Um, but I, th- you know, I guess the way I think about it is, you know, he, he went through something like pretty traumatic. So with even, it, I think it made him more real. Cause that's the thing I always had a problem with the aura. I was just like, this is too fantastical. Can't get on board. But I mean, you know, Thor Ragnarok, I had a new love for him. And then I, I think this one made him so much more personable. And it's like, it's like with any real person who would have like a tragedy, you know, they, some people fall into a depression. They maybe gain a little weight. They have trouble getting back into their real world. And, you know, that makes sense to me that he would go through something like that. You don't think about it. It's like, oh, well, he's a superhero. He shouldn't really actually experience that. But that's what makes him such a redeemable character. I'm so glad that they resisted the temptation in the final battle for him to raise his axe and the lightning hits and he's got his costume on and for it to be like how he was before, mm-hmm. like to have the lightning powers, like bring him back to his, you know, chiseled. original. Yeah. Right. No, I think he, first of all, he looks like a Viking warrior, which was kind of cool. I know. I mean, if I'm being perfectly honest, there's, there's a little part of me that was attracted to fat Thor. Dad, dad bought Thor yeah, does it yeah. for you. <laughs> I mean, this it, pose well for me and we are laying in bed. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was into it. But the other thing that I really liked, and I, I get it, I'm not trying to deny that they did play some of it for laughs and very intentionally for laughs, mm-hmm. but I think people who don't like this version of Thor also are like looking past the amazing performance of like when Hulk and Rocket show up in his in his mm-hmm. house in New Asgard oh God, and was... they say, I know like you're upset about Thanos, and he just like this moment where he's like, don't say yeah. that name. Why would you say that name? Like you can feel like the pain and Thor and all these memories. Yeah. No, I, I think I was already crying at that at point. That but point that right. made me, I was crying through about three quarters of the movie. Yeah. And there, that was another one where just like a burst came out of more tears. I mean, he really felt like, you know, some of these these veterans that come home from war and they're just never the same person. Like I almost caught that that really like this is what I was missing from Iron Man three mm-hmm. where they had just done this big thing and, and Tony was dealing with like PTSD, but they kind of didn't handle it like it was either played for laughs or not played at all. Mm-hmm. They like forgot about it. But then with Thor, like I totally believed it. I totally believe that this was a man who was just tortured and he is trying to drink himself to either forget or to death yeah you know well also like he lost his whole family yeah he has other people he's close to but it's like his brother's gone his mom's gone his dad's gone like he's got no one right and so like you can you can totally understand why they would take him where he he needed to like if he needed to go there you could totally understand why they took him there yeah and i've i've also heard people say like well he lost it all in infinity war it's like but in infinity war the one thing he had that he didn't have anymore was the drive the for revenge i want to kill thanos that's what's keeping me from completely losing myself mm-hmm. right now and once he kills thanos and it doesn't matter he kills thanos in the first 10 minutes and it doesn't matter anymore mm-hmm where do you go from there? Like that's, that's something that most superhero movies would never bother to tackle. Right. Which I thought was really cool. So fat Thor, it gets a pass from me and I'm, I'm interested to see if he will show up in guardians three, if they're going to keep that going. Oh, he has to. I feel like that was the whole purpose of the ending. You never know. I mean, I, and I, part of me wonders too, if like they're, you know, at the start of guardians three, if him and Pratt will be doing, push-ups in a contest and he's back to like his regular Thor body and it's like their way of saying like oh they've been so competitive they're both now super in shape oh yeah totally probably yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like uh who knows how long the fat Thor I will last but it, them either way but it works for this movie for sure and it leaves us like for once it's like I like that Thor's full arc you know when he starts in that first movie he's going to be the new king and now it's like there's no one left. You, Valkyrie, are more suited for that. I don't I don't have to be what I'm supposed to be anymore. I can finally go figure out what I want to be, mm-hmm. which is like a crazy turn, you know? I loved it. I was I was on board. So let's talk about uh, Ant-Man. He comes in this movie. For me, 
I'm not an Ant-Man fan. I don't really like the first movie at all. I think Ant-Man and the Wasp is slightly better. He was fine in Civil War. I thought he was great in this movie. Agreed on all. I actually suddenly liked Ant-Man. <laughs> right. It was finally they were like, okay, Paul, you've been in a few movies. You're allowed to act now. Yeah. You know? And he did such a great job, too. Like, I think that's actually when my crying started. Right. Was pretty early on when he saw his daughter for the first time, and it was endgame. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love that. I love that, like, you know, they talk about Doctor Strange saw this, like, one in 14 million, and it's like, yeah. That one thing was just that rat walking across, got him out of the quantum realm, yeah. and it all started from there, which is pretty cool. And I like that, yeah, he actually felt like he gave a damn. Can I stop you right there, though? Sure. Because you keep saying, like, there's only one way, and you always, come, when you and I talk about this, you always come on, it was the rat that was the random thing, but it wasn't the rat what was that it? started it. It was... Doctor Strange making the decision to hand the Infinity Stone to Thanos. That was the one way. It wasn't the rat starting it. It was Doctor Strange saying, this is the only way. Hand the Time Stone to Thanos, and then everything will be okay. I love that I've now gotten you to the point where you will um actually me. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how long it would take. Well, I mean, I think that's what what I appreciate about this one was... <laughs> They, I feel like they, you know, closed a good amount of story loops right. and, like, made things make sense. See, if things are, like, too fantasy or way out there, like, science fiction, you lost me. Sure. But they made everything connect for the most part. Yeah, let's talk about the time travel because I think the time travel is the other thing that people are, like, losing their minds, doing backbends, I trying to I think I just out. need to talk to, like, a mathematician to really truly understand that the first time through i had no idea what hulk said the first time he tried to explain it i think the second time i understood it's like you just had to explain it to me both times right it's like if you are here now and you travel into the past then going into the past is your future so you can't change the past because that's your future i get it that actually makes that tracks for me yes what does what where it got kind of murky and where I'm just like, all right, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. But I think where people are getting confused is when the ancient one explains it, she's like, no, it's the infinity stones. And when you take one out, things get all weird. And it's like, oh, okay. I don't, at a certain look, I think people are going to tear apart this time travel just like any other time travel story. I don't think it matters. Well, I think only like a bored physicist would. <laughs> I mean, look, I, even I've like looked at certain things from a like logical point of view. I mean, it's like they have three stones in New York, but at the same time, there were two on Asgard. You had the Tesseract, which had been there when Thor brought Loki at the end of Avengers into Thor the Dark World. Yeah. And you had the ether. It's like, well, why didn't you have Rocket and Thor get two and then they get two in New York and it's a little bit more even. But and the Tesseract was on, no, the Tesseract was on Earth. No, it wasn't. The Tesseract was in Odin's vault, remember? So Thor uses the Tesseract to take him and Loki home at the end of Avengers. And then it stays in Odin's vault until the end of Thor Ragnarok when Loki walks by it and then grabs it. So there are two stones on Asgard at the time of Thor the Dark World. That's also why they deliver the ether at the end of the Dark World to the Collector, because he's like, you shouldn't keep two stones in the same place. But technically it was also on Earth, because that's what they grab on Earth. But And in, then they miss it, and then they had to go back further in but time. But they're in 2012, and then Rocket and Thor are in 2013. No, I'm, so I'm saying, like, you could go either way. You can get two in Asgard and two on Earth, or you can get three on Earth and one on Asgard. It's just either way, either way. The point I'm trying to make with all of this was, even as you can see, we can tear this apart for hours if we want to. And I think people have. I think there's there's Reddit threads. There's the, the writers have put out interviews. The directors have put out interviews. And their two interviews don't even, like mesh with the right information but it's like at the end of the day it's like they just wanted to go to where the best scenes would happen you're you... just disagreeing with me because i'm right 
I'm not. What? Am, <laughs> how am I disagreeing with you? Isn't this the, exactly the point you made? It's like who cares as long as the as you're having fun and the movie's good. Does the time travel really matter? That is my point. Yeah, I'm I'm helping you make your point. By the way, thanks, babe. Yeah, because <laughs> I think I think at the end of the day, you know, there's an interview that was going around that the writers were trying to find where the stones were because they didn't want to go to the end of the first Avengers movie. They were like, that feels kind of like everyone's expecting it or feels maybe too cheesy. And the Russo brothers were like, no, everybody wants to go back to that one. What are you doing? Yeah. Go back to that. No. And I think that was my favorite part of this movie is them playing with time travel. It made it so much more fun for me. In and what way? I mean, I know you could just do time travel, like probably in most movies that are just like, okay, that was fun. Right. But this, I think because it was specific to this whole Marvel saga, they haven't really gone there with like with any other movie that I can think of. So I'm glad they brought that element and because I really loved seeing, you know, going into like the different eras, like where, you know, Cap was technically alive or right. like had existed. I think, um, that's who I'm most interested to see is like, I like, you know, going back and seeing him basically talk to himself, fight himself. And right. then um, going back to like the base where he was like made. Right. Um, and him seeing uh, Carter. Yeah. So I, and then I love that Iron Man got to, or um, uh, yeah, Iron Man got to meet his dad. I thought that was the coolest scene. And to go like that far back, like basically capturing Every time period throughout the Marvel saga was so fun. I think that, and Marvel has done a great job. If you go back to that first Iron Man movie, I think we talked about this in the bigger podcast. Like, they did a, uh, Iron Man 1 is fairly grounded. Like, it is, it is a guy who makes a suit and it's all technology based. And you start there and they don't just slam you with, you know, like Guardians of the Galaxy or anything right away. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get 22 movies in, like time travel doesn't seem that ridiculous anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like you've just bought into the logic of the Marvel world. And it opened up uh, a chance to see cameos from characters that you're like, that that makes sense that they would be there. Like, yeah. I loved seeing Robert Redford's character from Winter Soldier. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Frank Grillo, who was Crossbones, mm -hmm. also being there. And the ancient one. I love that now in my mind, when I watch the first Avengers, I always think, oh, the Sanctum is just a couple streets over and she's silently helping. That was one of my favorite scenes. And I love Tilda Swinton in that character, too. And she... She did such a good job, just that whole explanation of everything and, like, that realization of, oh, my God, if you're really, what you're telling me is true and Strange gave away the time stone, he must have done it for a reason. Right. And seeing that, like, look come across her face like, I need to actually listen to him was pretty amazing for me. Another character that I feel, like, really stepped up their game in this movie, and she's been stepping it up for a while now was Karen Gillan as Nebula. Yes. I feel like Nebula was a character in that first Guardians of the Galaxy movie that was like, oh man, you are way too mustache twirly bad guy. And now she has so much pathos by the end of this movie that uh -huh. it's, it was almost like cathartic to see her kill her old self. Yeah. Like I am not that person oh, anymore. I didn't think about that. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it's the Kylo Ren kill, kill the past. Yeah. You know, let the past die. Um, but I love that she, it, like, it just the evolution of that character. It's like the minute that they, uh, her and Tony touch down on Earth after they've been stranded, Rocket just comes up, but they don't say anything to each other, and they just grab each other's hands. I hand. loved that. Yeah. It made me very happy that they were there for each other. But again, like, goes back to, they all just went through a huge tragedy. Mm -hmm. They're missing, like, most of the people they call family. Right. And... You know, yeah, Rocket and Nebula are like kind of the closest people, you know, they have um, in their lives at that point. So it's it was nice to see them come together like that. Yeah, I also thought I loved that, like, you know, in the last couple Guardians movies, it was it was Gamora who was always trying to win Nebula over like, we are sisters. Come mm -hmm. on. You don't want to do this. Yeah. And this time it was like the other way around. Like, I promise you, we in the future, we are friends. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be with Thanos. Like, I'm here to help you. Right. Which I thought was a cool little reversal. It brought Nebula full circle. 
Yeah. In the comics, sure. she's the one that actually gets the gauntlet to end all this stuff. Oh, so, no way. So I really thought they were going to do that. But they, they kind of homage it because I think at one point when they're playing hot potato with the gauntlet, she has it right. for a second, which was kind of cool. Um, let's talk about uh, we did say goodbye to some characters. Mm-hmm. Black Widow being one of them, which I, I think... I didn't see that. See, ugh, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I don't think... You know, we... You know, just the nature of how, you know, like, Deadline and Variety and Hollywood Reporter, like, we know that a Black Widow movie's coming, so we just naturally assumed she'd be safe, and she wasn't. Or e- even... I thought that they would somehow bring her back at the end. Right. Um. I also was kind of surprised I, I guess here was my thought process when that whole scene was happening where they were trying to fight for who was gonna you know sacrifice themselves but I kind of assumed that she would be the one to sacrifice him because she doesn't really have anyone else so like the whole point of the soul stone is like you need to give up what you who you love most and you know he's got his family he loves other people I mean I know they're gone at this right. point but I just feel like it made more sense for her to say, like, I actually love you most, so it makes more sense for me to, like, get rid of you. And then don't worry, I'll, like, I'll get you back somehow. The one thing I noticed on the second time we watched it was, (laughs) and it's not a big deal at all, but the Red Skull changes his wording ever so slightly the second time around. And it's more just like, oh, it's just a soul for a soul. Like, Whoever goes, whoever dies, then you get the soul yeah, stone. Which, if he just said that, that would make sense, right? And I like, I I'm curious to see it one more time in theaters, and I really want to pay attention to what the dialogue is because I feel like they play a little fast and loose with the rules on on that That's one. That's what I didn't get. You know? I was like, wait, 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 how did we make this decision? Right, or you know what I thought was going to happen? I thought one of I was like, oh well, I think they're going to like outsmart that's what i thought i thought there was gonna be yeah. outsmarting of it's some like sort. oh if you sacrifice yourself then it's like oh you found out how to get the stone without anyone yeah. dying it's like nope i was very surprised I'm like nope straightforward kill someone get the soul stone yep no, she's not and that's it she's not co- well here's the thing i would say she's not coming back but i find it interesting that right at the end of the movie where Captain America is about to go back in time and put the stones back where mm-hmm. he found them, which, by the way, how is he going to put the soul stone back? No idea. Right. So I guess I I think there's something coming from that where he's put the soul stone back and there's got to be some trade off. Well, the interesting thing was they take the time in that moment for the Hulk to say, hey, when I snapped, I tried to bring her back. And it's like, why would you call attention to that one last time if that doesn't mean something later Mm -hmm. on? Because we've already grieved her in a scene way earlier. Right. So why would you call that back if that never comes up again? So maybe you're right. Maybe maybe there'll be a way around it. Maybe she shows up. Maybe maybe her movie, which now everyone's like, oh, it must be a prequel. It's like. What if she just has no memory and she's just walking around somewhere, this one of the world's greatest assassins, and she has no idea that's who she is? That's you know? interesting. Yeah. I'll watch that. So who knows what that movie's going to end up being. Uh, but for the movie, I think it worked. It closed her out because really that's all, you know, she's been saying since the very first Avengers movie, she just wants really to clear her conscience of everything that she had done in the past, you know? and. Mm-hmm. This was her way of kind of finally atoning for whatever sins she had done, which that's why I kind of if they do, if it's not a prequel movie for her, then I hope they there's flashbacks or something, because that's the one thing that's held me back from really latching on to Black Widow. She always talks about this, this horrible past that she had, but we've never seen it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, we kind of saw glimpses of it when she talked saw, in Ultron, right? Yeah, we saw like her training, but it's like what? terrible things did she do Mm -hmm. you know we we know from dialogue exchanges that she killed a lot of people and that black or that uh hawkeye was sent to kill her Mm -hmm. but ended up recruiting her right but we like i don't know i would like to i'd like to dig in more of like what made her so terrible yeah i mean hopefully we can expect that in the in her movie right Uh, speaking of hawkeye i thought he was Fine. I think they were. I think there just wasn't enough time to really get into Ronan and how like how much he had lost his mind as Ronan. 
Oh, oh, Hawkeye. Yeah. Sorry, I was confused. Um, yeah, it was, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that it was like a great start to the movie to just drop you right in from his perspective, which by the way, I guess that was something that they were going to put in an infinity war. And then they realized like, well, if this is the first time we're seeing Hawkeye, this whole movie, some people might just be like, wait, what, what's happening? So yeah. they, they ended up saving it for the cold open of this movie, which I think was a good choice. Right. And I, I loved that opening. Yeah. It, I think it was perfect. Um, yeah. I think, I think Clint did as good as Clint can do. <laughs> he did. Lived up to his average. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dislike Hawkeye, but if if Hawkeye is your favorite Avenger, tweet at me because I would I would love to talk to you. That's just fascinating. I, w- to I would me. like to know why too. <laughs> yeah, I just want to know. Why, like, no hate on Jeremy Renner at all. I just like. I I guess it's because I'm a big fan of Matt Fraction's Hawkeye comic book where they did a very different take of Hawkeye, and he's just such a funny, down to earth guy. He's like. He's a superhero, but he lives in this like rundown apartment complex and he never has enough quarter for his laundry and everyone calls him Hawk Guy. Oh. He's like, no, I'm Hawk Eye. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny and esoteric, and I was kind of hoping they do that with this character, but eh, it was fine. Yeah, I I'm not I don't dislike Hawkeye. I think he serves his purpose. He doesn't have a ton to do after Nat sacrifices herself. Like, he's there at the end, but yeah. he's Hawkeye. What is he going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fine. Um, let's <laughs> let's get Nothing into... <laughs> yeah, I've I've already wasted way too much time on Hawkeye <laughs> for a lifetime. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, getting into kind of the, the meat of, you know, the core Avengers... Uh, but before we get to Steve and Tony, just real quick, I know your favorite character is the Incredible Hulk. Yep. What did you think of Professor Hulk? Into it. Yeah, really? It was a little weird, but I like I like weird. Okay. Um, Because I know the thing that you like about him the most is like just the rage out monster, and it seems like that's not him anymore. I kind of like the idea that he can control it somewhat Mm -hmm. i think that makes him more powerful somehow um even though i like the raging hulk too but um there's something admirable about him being able to manage it i think one of my favorite uh i mean two of my favorite moments of this whole movie come from hulk one of them is a character moment where i think i realize like oh he could still be deadly you know, it's back in that scene where Thor's like, why would you say that name Thanos? And very oh. lovingly, Hulk is like, Thor, take your, take your hand off me. Because <laughs> oh. it's like, hey, I'm still a Hulk. I, I didn't catch still... that. He's like, I could still kill you, but I feel for you, yeah. you know? And then my other, like, probably the biggest laugh of the movie for me is when they go back to New York and he has to blend in with old Hulk. He's like, (laughs) just kind of smacks one of the cars. Like, I I don't know. I don't know how they're going to move that character forward or if there's a future for the Hulk in the MCU. But yeah, I I just think uh, Mark Ruffalo is just. I just I tried to picture the other day what Edward Norton would be like in all these movies Ew, and I just no. yeah I can't picture it. <laughs> I don't know if he'd be as playful as Mark Ruffalo has he, been. I don't think Edward Norton knows how to be playful in any role. Yeah, he just seems like he's just mad all the time. Yeah. I don't get me wrong. I actually like Ed Norton as an actor. Don't like him I like, for Hulk. I like his movies. Um I just I don't know. Yeah, no. Ruffalo is the ideal Hulk. So let's talk about uh Captain Steve Rogers, Captain America. What did you think of Cap, uh, his storyline and kind of wrapping up with it, passing on the mantle to a restored Falcon? I liked it. I, I was hoping that something would happen like that, but before I went into it, I'm like, okay, so the Captain America or Iron Man, who's going to die. And if Captain America is the one who's going to die, like, God damn, I hope he gets laid before this all goes down. <laughs> right, like, yeah. please. And that's what that's what I kept thinking about when they showed, you know, how like basically how he like had his life at the end. And right. like, thank God. You know what's so funny is like 
for months, I think people were like, it's got to be Tony or Cap. And I'm going to say Cap. A lot of people were saying I Cap. I really thought it was going to be Cap, too. But it makes so much sense why it couldn't be Cap. Mm-hmm. Because that wouldn't be the correct ending for his character arc. And I, and I realized that the second time we saw the movie, it's like he calls it out at the beginning of the movie. He's like sitting there with Black Widow. He's like. We need to get a life. Mm -hmm. And Tony always told me I need to get a life. Mm -hmm. And when you think back of like Age of Ultron and Tony's like, when are you going to like just, you know, go do something? He's like, no, I'm I'm a soldier. I do this. And it's like Steve's arc at the end was he got a life. Yeah. But let's touch on the fact that he ended up with Carter. Right. But he had also previously kissed, or maybe more we don't know of, with her niece. Right. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> it's like this generation's Leia kissing Luke. Yeah. I. And also, do we assume that if he went back in time, does he change her future? Right. Because it doesn't change his future, but does he change her future where she doesn't meet the guy that she originally ended up with. So there's there's different theories. And again, this is where the screenwriters have a different explanation than the directors do. And I think it's kind of like whatever suits your mind the best. But I personally think that he came back to a time where there was already a Captain America, like himself was there. So he lived in the shadows and let his other self be Captain America his whole life. And Peggy never says who her husband is. And she says Captain America in in Winter Soldier, she says in that video at the Smithsonian, like Captain America ended up saving my husband's life. Maybe it's him. Maybe it's always been him. That makes it weirder that he kissed his niece. But he doesn't know that's his niece. Okay. Or the alternative is that he went to an alternate dimension and that he was with Peggy in that alternate reality and then just so happened to uh zip over back to, to the again. backed over to the other reality just to pass off the shield. I don't like that one. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm more inclined to believe your first one. That he just was like yeah, I kiss my niece, whatever. Yes, I'll accept that. Thing, Weird things happen. Yeah. Some Game of Thrones. Maybe she's like not blood related to him. <sighs> but also, let, so, okay, let's say your theory is correct. Okay. Then wouldn't sh- the niece technically know who her uncle was already? And she'd be like, I already know that you're my uncle. And. Oh, maybe she, you're right. Maybe she's a kinky girl. Yeah, I. If there could be something messed up there. Or, I mean, she could just be like, you look a lot like someone I know. Is this like a <laughs> right. weird like, Yeah. I mean, people look different in their... Electro complex or Oedipus complex. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Look, this is the thing, and, and I said it back 10 minutes ago with the time travel. It's like, at a certain point, it's like, you just... Either you accept the emotional payoff or... Or you go searching for a logical one. And I think Endgame just was like, hopefully the emotional one is good enough for you. It is. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. And and look, I think one of the coolest moments in any comic book movie ever is Captain America getting Mjolnir. Getting what? Thor's hammer. Oh, I didn't know that that's what it was called. (laughs) What do you think it was like an STD? I don't know. I, this is like... oh, it's Captain America contracted Mjolnir yeah. from the one time he had sex with his niece. He deserved it. I thought it was like a dog. No, like, I don't know. Uh, no when he gets uh, he gets Thor's hammer. Okay. And I've, I read a theory that the reason, and I don't know if this is what they were intending or not, but I thought this was so cool if it was. He can't lift it in Age of Ultron, mm-hmm. right? But that's because he wasn't hundred He can kind of, but he can't lift it. He can budge it. But he wasn't all the way worthy because he still knew that Bucky had killed Tony's parents and he hadn't told them yet. Mm. Uh, if that's true, if, the, if they had that in mind and then he finally is worthy, fully worthy at the end, that's a really cool Yeah, I liked that a character lot. Arc. I thought that was fun seeing the two of them like pass back weapons and 
Thor going, nope, you take a little <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, just cool to see the hammer back and to see Cap, you know, wield it like a badass. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that whole last 20 minutes yeah. is just like, what is happening? There's so much going on. Yeah. Uh, one more thing on Captain America. He looked good as an old dude. You know what? Uh, like, handsome or like the CGI makeup was great? Both. Uh, they... Old age makeup is almost impossible to pull I usually off. get really angry if it's done poorly. This was done so well. But also, like, Chris Evans is going to look good when he gets old. Yeah, if that's I wonder, what he's going to look like. <laughs> I wonder if he's, like, freaked out, like... Oh, I think that would freak me out. Yeah. To know, like, hey, this is what I could potentially look like. Most likely. Yeah. But and he, and he nailed the voice, too. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't sound too much, but it sounds correct. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah, it's like we've been saying this whole time, like, Disney's getting really good at de-aging people, but I guess they can also re-age people? Yeah, I'm sure yeah. it works both ways. Yeah. And I was actually happy to see him hand it off to Falcon. I actually thought he was going to hand it off to Bucky, only because, like, I had read, like, little comic book blurbs or, right. like, Wikipedia things where, like, um, uh, Winter Soldier, like, beca- or Sebastian, mm-hmm. not Sebastian Stan, uh, but yeah, <laughs> Winter Soldier <laughs> becomes um, Captain America at some point. But you were saying, like, Falcon also becomes mm-hmm. Captain America. So I'm actually glad they chose it for Falcon, um, just because I think it'll give him more to do um, as Captain America versus Falcon. And, but the only thing is, like, he's not, like, a super soldier. Yeah, but I think. Like, I feel like the wings are what give him, like, his quote-unquote powers. But I think that also presents new opportunities for storytelling. Yeah. Whereas I feel like if it had been Bucky, it just would have, like, he's, he's he can't shake what he did as Winter Soldier, you know? Yeah, I'm actually glad they didn't right. give it to Bucky because, um, yeah, he can't shake what he did as Winter Soldier, but also, like, I, I think that's what makes him more fascinating. Right. Uh, like staying as Winter Soldier. And I hope they unpack that a little bit more at some point. Right. Falcon is just like Steve. He's a, a war veteran. Mm-hmm. You know, he's kind of like he's got this selfless loyalty. I can mm-hmm. definitely see him as Captain America moving forward. And I actually really like if they're to move forward and make a new Captain America movie, I'd be really interested in that one specifically mm-hmm. because I want to see like. How do you live up, A, to the legend of Captain America? B, how do you be uh, Captain America in this new world that we Mm -hmm. live in? Uh, Especially, you know, like five years has gone by for everybody. And that's that's a tough pill to swallow, man. You could Mm -hmm. come home after five years and find out that, like, your house has been bulldozed and there's an Arby's there. You know, Your, your wife moved on because she thought you were gone. So it's like... As a symbol of America, how do you hold America together? And three, you don't have the superpowers that Steve had. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you live up? Like, all those to me make way more interesting storytelling things mm-hmm. than, you know, if they had gone with Bucky. And, but they were smart. They were very smart because they knew that a lot of Sebastian Stan stands would be very upset that he didn't give it to Bucky. And so that's why I really feel that's why when Steve's sitting on that bench, they he's like, go ahead, man. Go go talk to him. Not you go. And then <laughs> Sam looks over to him when he gets the shield and Bucky just nods in approval like, yeah. I'm cool. Yeah. I don't need it, you know? <laughs> but I feel like they had to put that in there or Sebastian Stan, like diehards, would be like, why isn't it Bucky? That's his best friend. No, but then he'd have to cut his hair and I, I like the little little long hair deal he's got it's good it fits him yeah yeah we'll see uh where he goes and of course the man of the hour mr robert Downey jr tony stark who this has for me is easily his best performance as iron man Mm -hmm. probably ever yeah yeah it's i'm i was really sad at the outcome Mm -hmm. but Again, made sense why they did it. And I loved seeing him, like, get all the things he wanted for that short time. You know, he got married to Pepper. He was, seemed like he was relaxing somewhat. And he had his kid. And, you know, he wanted to do everything to protect that. But it's, 
I think the thing that comes up for me is like when he sees his dad like in the past right. and the one thing his dad says to him is like you know I'm really glad that or he goes I'm really glad um, that like or I'd be really glad if it was a girl because then I like he w- it wouldn't be like a selfish guy like me and then at the very end he's like there's nothing I would, wouldn't do for my kid right. too it's and I, I think yet. like yeah. those are the things that like really you know he latched on to when he went back to back to the future (laughs) um and you know he couldn't let it go yeah there's there's definitely like and that's why i love the parallels between steve and tony where steve steve had to get a life Mm -hmm. he had to learn how to take a little bit for himself whereas tony had to learn how to give up he was trying so hard not to be selfish and what that means um but even so, I have to call it out. Look, I last year I did a video essay about how Tony Stark was the real villain of the MCU. I did receive death threats. People were very upset. But hey. if Tony Stark had, I get it. He doesn't like, he, and he makes it very clear the entire time. I'm only doing this if we bring everybody back, but we can't undo the last five years. Can't yeah. undo them. That causes so many problems for everybody. Why? To not, for the the reasons I just laid out 30 <laughs> seconds ago. How many people, like, uh, they're going to have to address Far From Home that half of Peter's friends are now sophomores in college. That people thought that their spouses were dead, probably tried to move on, met new people. Uh, then they just all of a sudden reappear again. It's like, why is there another man in my house? Yeah, but then if he puts it back to the way it was, you're still causing distress. Like, it's a lose-lose situation. Absolutely not. If you can snap your fingers and basically anything you want happens, why wouldn't you just undo Thanos and go back to a time where no one was ever snapped away? Yeah, but then you lose out on, like, there could have been more people, like, born into the world, and then those people lose their kids. And... You know, but yeah, let's say someone did move on because I thought their spouse was dead. Like, then they lose out on that. Like, it's, you know, it, it causes distress either way. So, you know, he was, I think he was still being selfish, probably to the end. But he sacrificed himself for, like, for some greater good. He couldn't win either way. Probably not. I just think it's interesting because at first I was like, man, they're, They're really like backing themselves into a corner, moving everything up five years. But then I was like, "Mm, maybe there's like some cool stuff if they if they are diligent about using it. If we go into Spider-Man Far From Home and the idea of like the world needs to adjust to five years gone for half Mm -hmm. the people is not addressed. I'll be irritated. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't blow it. Yeah. But, the, you know, they they brought out the new Spider-Man Far From Home trailer. And it seems like we're at least addressing the fact that the world is mourning Tony Stark. Yeah. Um, I still I, I read an interview the other day that that Robert Downey Jr. was not sold on saying I am Iron Man at the end when he snapped. And to me, that's like the defining moment of the entire MCU. It's... I don't blame him though. I feel like there's a few lines throughout M Game that come very close to being cheesy, but the actors did a good job delivering them, and so I could see why it, when Robert Downey Jr. first reads it, it's like I don't know if I want to say that, but the more he practices, like okay, I can pull this off. I'm a good fucking actor, and then he just did it. What What were some of the other cheesy lines? Um. I feel like there was, like, some other, maybe it's not necessarily lines, but, like, to some degree, I think, like, Avengers Assemble could be, like, kind of cheesy. Do you know how many people would riot if they didn't finally say it? Okay, no, but they have to say it. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done those things, but, like, it's just because it comes from a comic book. It's very, like, you know, this is all coming together, and, you know, so... I'm not saying they shouldn't have done it, but I can understand why Robert Downey Jr. was hesitant. I just, it's so perfect. It, it kicks off the MCU at, in one of the greatest moments in MCU history where they were like, we're going to undo all these superhero tropes of trying to hide your identity and just be like, nope, I am Iron Man. Yeah. And we close out at least this chapter 
of the MCU with, and I am Iron Man. And I love that he didn't do the like big actory death. He doesn't really say anything uh-huh. after he like as he's dying. He he lets other people react to that moment and that makes it more powerful yeah. than him giving a long soliloquy about move on without me i want this or whatever it is yeah i think actually spider-man did that for him because i keep commenting on uh how pepper just comes up he's like okay okay let me talk to my husband you, you need to move <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> who are you again yeah. <laughs> i love that though i love that uh you know he just he he's so spent from those stones that like he can't even really talk yeah like he knew what he was doing yeah uh a great moment i also think my favorite scene in the entire mcu before this movie was cap and iron man or i should say steve and tony in civil war and he gets this close to getting steve to sign and then he blows it because the two of them have explosive chemistry and the acting is off the charts and mm-hmm. you feel the aggression and the irritation on both sides might be removed now replaced with the beginning when Tony comes in. I think it had to have been CGI where he looks very sickly mm-hmm. from being up in space and he just loses it on Captain America mm-hmm. for not being there for him. And it was the most real that Tony has ever been in any of these movies. Mm-hmm. Just no. love that scene. Oh, yeah. No, I thought that was fantastic to see. Um, and I was like, did, he didn't really lose weight. That must have been a CGI situation, too. It, it must have been, but it was done so well yeah. that he looked really sick. Mm-hmm. But I love that, that he's like, no plan, no information. And he's just like, no trust, liar. Yeah. I loved that because it's like just like... You don't expect that to happen because when they first see each other, he's like, I lost the kid. And he's like, Tony, we lost everybody. And Mm -hmm. I thought they were going to be like, look, whatever we had, it doesn't matter anymore. And he's like, no, this is your fault. You should have been there for me and Mm -hmm. you weren't there. Like that was just like a turn that I guess I wasn't expecting. I mean, it showed like, I mean, you always knew that Tony cared for Captain America. Right. Finally, he like admits it in a way. Right. You know, in that in that whole scene. So, you know, and I think Steve also realizes, like, yeah, like, I, I care about him, too. Like, they, it sucked that they were disagreeing and they were apart for so long. But, yeah, they need they they need each other. Yeah, it, it just, like, makes me, when I think of that scene and then I think of, like, Civil War where he's, like, he's my friend. Tony's, like, so was I. Yeah. Like, just that friendship, how strained it got over the last few years. And then, like, them coming back together and Tony, like in his very Tony way, like both apologizing and forgiving him by giving him back his shield, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't know. It just like, it was was like, ah, finally, you know, three years later, I I feel good about this again. You You know, know? but I I thought, I I wonder if Tony went into it thinking like, I'm I'm probably going to die going into this. Cause even at the end he was like, try not to die. Like when he was t- explaining, like, here's what I want to happen. This is the only way I'm going to do this. And it's like, right. this, 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 this. Oh, and try not to die. If I, I mean, he, I think he absolutely knew because he recorded that message for his mm-hmm. daughter. And he's like, we're going to try this. I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. But know? I think part of his thing was like, make amends with Steve Rogers, who's someone he cares about. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, that's why I feel... I don't know what they're going to do moving forward. Do you recast, not recast in terms of like a new Tony Stark, but like, do you let someone else wear the Iron Man armor? Do you just let the Iron character go? What do you do? I would let it go. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there are so many other heroes to bring in potentially. And like, how does the only reason Iron Man works is because Tony Stark's a, you know, billionaire sure so unless you find another billionaire i mean you theoretically if you wanted to do you know any sort of like logic hoops to jump through you could be like oh yeah black panther and shuri helped him whoever it is build a new suit you know with wakandan technology maybe maybe yeah at that point though you already have black panther with a vibranium suit yeah um do you think that uh roadie still does iron things or 
Do you think that was kind of like an ending for Rhodey too? I mean, I hope he retires. The guy can barely walk. That's true. I did. By the way, I loved that. It's just a quick moment, but where him and Nebula kind of like lament over the fact like, oh, we're both kind of broken, reconfigured, reconstructed Mm -hmm. people. And I was like, that's why they put them together. Yeah. I was like, now it now it tracks for me. I like that. Yeah. Uh, look, there's so much in this movie that I really like. Was there anything that didn't click with you? You know what I'm going to say. I don't know why this bothers you as much as it does. So let me explain. Okay. The first time we saw Endgame, it's at the funeral scene. And they're like, you know, panning over all the people that are there. And there's this one fucking dude that they go over so quickly. I'm like, who the F is that? I like that you said the full F word and then (laughs) censored yourself the second time, by the way. But like they went went over it so fast and it like you can't quite recognize who it is. And during like such an emotional scene, it totally took me out of it. Like, oh, there's, you know, Thor and there's, you know, Hawkeye and his whole family. Like, who is that? Who is that? And then you just lose the whole scene because you're just focused on that and trying to figure out who it is. Obviously, she's talking about Harley, the kid from uh, Iron Man 3, which, by the way, pissed me off. So I saw an interview with the Russo brothers recently. I almost sent it to you, but I was like, I'm not going to stoke that fire. But they (laughs) said they did test screenings and most of the people had the same reaction. Like, who is that? Yeah. They almost cut it out. And then they were like, you know what? Sometimes Easter eggs are fun. If you don't know who it is, it doesn't crush the scene for you. It does because like I get it. Easter eggs. But it's like you're in this like whole emotional state and then you just get shaken out of it trying to figure out who this stranger is. I mean, the problem is like the kid like had a major growth spurt from that's a whole Iron Man like who, how am i supposed to know who that was and it's not like they like slowly like say like pay attention to who this is see if you can figure it out it's like well, let's just quickly go over him and you're you know thrown off it also just makes me laugh by the way that it's a funeral where everyone stands in order of how important they think they are yes. to tony <laughs> it's like it's like uh no you need to be back like three or four clusters yeah. of people <laughs> I don't know if everyone was actually there that day. I, I, I've i seen it twice now, and I can't tell if anyone CGI'd in or if they were actually there or not. The only one that I was like, are you really there, was uh, William Hurt, who I didn't even see the first time. Oh, I saw him. Yeah. But I was also like, why are you there? <laughs> yeah, you were kind of a dick to him <laughs> yeah, the entire like, time. Did, did you need to be here? Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I could see like a few. I think all the Ant Man people were not. Yeah, they were there. They were actually there. Oh, you mean like they 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 were were CGI'd? CGI'd? Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. I I, I have no idea. Look, if they were able to schedule it that they got every single person there, like bravo to whoever that coordinator was that was able to. I mean, maybe they weren't. Maybe they did do it because I I was looking at someone's Instagram. I think it was like Chris Pratt's, and he had posted this video like illegally pretty much right that he like kind of scanned over the whole set and you see like all the actors that are part of it from that big end battle yeah Yeah. and he like he was saying like it's kind of amazing that all of us are here on one day so maybe they did do it maybe they did um the only other thing that i'm not gonna say it didn't work but it was just like all right they really for me i was like okay we get the pager for Captain Marvel at the end of Infinity War. We get a whole Captain Marvel movie in between. She's really probably got to be the key to something. She's barely in this thing. And I get why. It's because you find out when she shows up, it's like, oh, if she was here the whole time. This thing would be over in two and a half minutes. It's like, that's the problem they're going to have with their moving forward is like, she's so powerful. How are you going to like stack the odds against her? I just... I think they te- did a test run for the Captain Marvel movie and kept it really light for Endgame. And I think whether or not Captain Marvel did what they wanted it to, maybe they won't bring her back. I mean, the thing is, her movie made well over a billion dollars. Yeah. It was huge. 
That being said, it must have also been strange for her that she shot Endgame before she shot her own movie. Yeah. And it kind of shows because there's literally no time for her to have any sort of personality. Like, she just delivers the line flat and then it's gone. Yeah. Except I kind of do like the little sass. Not sass, but she just has a way of like... Hi, Peter Parker. You got yeah. something for it. Like, I actually liked that, you know? That was cute, yeah. But <laughs> she's just like, she's just there. Mm-hmm. And I really thought, I I think we all kind of thought at the end of Infinity War, it's like, oh, Captain Marvel's like the key to all of this. It's like, no, she's just another one that yeah. was there. You I know? thought she was going to be part of the time travel somehow. Um, bef- yeah, I, I, but yeah, she was none of it. <laughs> she was not there. <laughs> she for was none of it. <laughs> but it's it's like crazy too, like how much that like she goes up against Thanos and he like headbutts her yeah. and she's just like, bro, come yeah. on now. Like he literally has to take the power stone out and punch her in the face with it just to get her away. I know. Which that was a cool moment, by the way. But it also made me wonder too, is like, could she have withstood the power if she had all the infinity stones to snap? Probably. I would, I would think so. I mean, the thing that I like about her is like the kind of the same reason why I like Hulk, but she has a very good ability to just go through the middle of ships yeah. and just break them. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, tear that shit up. Like, that's what I like about her. And that's about it. Yeah. I, I don't dislike the character. Uh, I don't, I don't even dislike Brie Larson. I know a lot of. A lot of white men don't like Brie Larson, but why? We'll talk afterwards. It's just too draining to get okay. into on this podcast. That's really weird. Um, <laughs> but I, I do hope like this was just a very odd way to introduce her into the MCU with like a a mediocre at best movie, and then a big, huge Avengers event where she had no idea who her character was shooting that first and then going to do her own movie. Yeah. Like, I wonder if they had shot her movie first and then end game, if anything would have been a little bit different, you know? Yeah. I don't know. If she could have brought something a little bit different to it, you know? I'm not sure. I, I mean, the whole time's like, she's just busy in other galaxies. So either we find out eventually what she's been doing right. in other galaxies and universes or in other planets or just that's what she does. And that's all she does. Well, like I said, Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars. So you're going to find out in Captain Marvel, probably two, three, four, five. <laughs> like, they're just going to keep making them. Okay. You don't have to see them. Uh, actually, that, that brings up a good point. Avengers Endgame. It's the end of what uh, they're calling, like, the Infinity Saga. Technically, Far From Home, they're saying, is, like, the end of, of this phase. Uh, but... Let's be real here. End game. Closing yeah. it out. Where do you stand now? Like, are you? Because I walked out of the theater. I was like, look, this will never happen because I know thyself. But if it all were to end here, I could walk away and feel pretty damn good about this whole series. Yes. Agreed. I also, if they attempt to do any sort of like new series, like bringing in new characters and heroes, whatever. Like, I just don't think there'll be anything. Thing as good as like the OG Marvel crew. Maybe, maybe not. There are some movies, rare, but it happens where things start out pretty good and then the sequels are bad and then they have like a renaissance. I- I'm thinking specifically Fast and Furious. I was just going to say that. <laughs> but also, like, think of like Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible didn't hit their stride until the fourth movie. And really? Yeah. Oh. I liked number two. Oh, you are in a way minority. I don't have you back on an episode to talk about. I mean, I'm picky with sequels. I usually don't like to watch them at all, but, um, you know, there's there's a select few I'm down for. So where do you want the MCU to go from here? I mean, we both watched the new Spider-Man Far From Home trailer yesterday, and we yeah. both were like, that looks better than the first one. Yeah, that looks a lot better than the first one for sure, and made me more interested to see it. Um, 
I'm curious to see what's his name Mysterio. Mysterio. Yeah, I'm curious to see what he's all about. He also there was in the trailer they mentioned something about like a multiverse. Mm -hmm. So curious like how they if if they do connect like the time travel and multiverse stuff in that movie, and then part of me was wondering though or kind of worried. It's like. Is the multiverse Sony's backup plan? Because, you know, Sony has a deal with Marvel to include Spider-Man in the MCU. Yeah. That if they're like, screw it, we don't want to do the MCU stuff anymore. That Tom Holland goes through the multiverse and then shows up with crappy Tom Hardy Venom in that verse. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Only because <laughs> I oh. weirdly loved Venom oh. because it was terribly hilarious hilariously terrible it's so bad it's so bad but it made it so good eddie <laughs> i i think well venom before this movie has always been one of my favorite villains and so i was so excited to see venom when it came out but if they brought back venom totally into it uh, it's just so freaking silly i love it so we know we have black panther 2 coming doctor strange 2 Guardians 3. Then, of course, you got some new movies. You have uh, an Asian, uh, first Asian Marvel Asian hero that it's a character I'm not actually very familiar with, uh, Shang-Chi, that I think is going to bring in some of the more, uh, I, I, I think it's more like Iron Fist, where it's like more kind of like Kung Fu type hero. But honestly, I don't really know anything about him. And maybe in the past, it would have been like, I don't know. But I didn't really know anything about Guardians of the Galaxy either. Yeah. And that they ended up being my favorite franchise. I am I will be pretty attached to Guardians mm. if they keep going. I like Doctor Strange. I'll give Spider-Man a try. Mm. Um, I really hope they bring around a She-Hulk. So there's rumors, rumors that there could be a Hulk, She-Hulk show on Disney+. Plus. Yes to that. But I will be very disappointed if they cast someone as She-Hulk that I don't think is She-Hulk material. <laughs> Just saying. I mean, who today is She-Hulk material? I don't know. I got to think about it. Who do I need to call to send in my, my recommendations? Because it doesn't necessarily have to be like, you know, I see like the typical like Ronda Rousey, Gina no, Carano. No, no, like. No. Mark Ruffalo doesn't seem like a Hulk, but he is the Hulk, yeah. you know, so it could be anybody. No, I, I'll, I'll get back to you. Then, of course, we also have, you know, we we're talking about Disney Plus. We have the Hawkeye show. We have Loki. Wait, Hawkeye's getting a show? He is. Why? Uh, I think he's going to train Kate Bishop, who in the comics becomes the new Hawkeye. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, The Loki show, which Loki gets away with the Tesseract Love in that Loki universe. on board. Okay. Uh, I, we'll see if the name stays the same, but Falcon Winter Soldier. Digging it. Yep. And then uh, one of the ones that I'm looking forward to, uh, just because I want to see what this is going to be, WandaVision. Mm, okay. They say it has like a 50s inspired aesthetic. I'll try it. But it's just like Vision, I actually thought like, okay, they'll find a way to rebuild him or something. No mention of Vision. Like, he's just gone. Yeah. I I like them together. I hate it when she calls him Viz. Like, <laughs> ew, your, stop. Your hang-ups are very <laughs> strange. I just, I don't know why. They're just so, that one's so weird to me. Viz. It doesn't bother you that she just drops her quote-unquote Sokovian accent like by Infinity War. She's, She's like, acclimating. It's like my mom from New York moving to California. You uh, only get like a an every once a in coffee? a while like dog coffee. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, she's she's uh So now Wanda is just, well, the occasional like paprika. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is the paprika. Yeah. <laughs> the paprika. Um, okay. So we ranked all the Marvel movies. Uh, I'm not look. I I don't even remember exactly where I ranked everything, but where at least generally are you gonna put Endgame now? Just below Infinity War. 
Where did you have Infinity War? Do you remember? I think Top it five? was number three. Okay. So you like Infinity War better than Endgame. Slightly, yes. I happen to agree with you, and I'll tell you why, at least for me. First of all, I love Endgame. Endgame is yeah. everything I could have possibly asked for. I totally understand now why they did not call it Infinity War Part 2, because mm-hmm. it is a very different movie than Infinity War. Mm-hmm. I think Infinity War, why it's so rewatchable for me, is there is a very focused sense of dread throughout all of Infinity War. And it's like the clock is running the second that movie starts. Right. And I was like, man, why is Infinity War so funny? And I realized it's like because everything feels so dire that any comic relief we get is like times a thousand because you're like, okay, I just need to laugh. You yeah. Know? Because it, it gets intense. Um, whereas in game we start kind of like wallowing and it's great. And you have to, because that makes infinity war mean something, mm-hmm. but it, it doesn't like, it's like it's wallowing and then it's a time heist. And then it's like the biggest comic book splash page you could possibly make. Right. So it's like, it, it's, it's unfocused, but in a very satisfying way. But I feel like infinity war is like precise precision. Mm-hmm. focus. Agreed. I, I think that's why I liked it slightly better too. Um, and also, I think, I mean, because you're, you know, most of the characters are dead in Endgame. Like, I like right. having everyone in everyone Infinity there. War for the most part. I mean, and the other thing that Infinity War has over Endgame, and I get it, and there's no way around it is, that was the first time they let a lot of the story be told from the perspective of the villain, Thanos. Mm-hmm. So, Endgame Thanos kind of suffers from early Marvel, just like villain of the week, you know, because mm-hmm. it's just like he's there. We have the benefit of knowing Thanos a little bit better, but he's not the Thanos that we got to know the first time right. around. Um, but still, you know, look, I I love Endgame. It's definitely top five. I I feel like this is one that I'll probably end up rewatch. Like I think Infinity War, Endgame, just like back to back, is mm-hmm. probably going to be on our TVs a lot. Yes, I'm getting a craving to see it again. Actually, good. I've been waiting for you to want to see it again in a theater. Okay, <laughs> we'll go. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for joining me for joining us. In our bed. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us next week. It is the episode that has been one of the most requested. It is the episode I've been talking about since before I ever started even recording the show. I will have Josh Makuga on, and we are finally talking Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And Josh Makuga is going to light me up like a Christmas tree. Sweet. Yeah. It's going to be great. That's coming next week. And if you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening. Like and subscribe on YouTube. You can leave a nice little review on iTunes. That always helps. And go check out some of the other stuff. I just had Mr. Star Trek, Scott Mance, talking Star Trek Generations. Uh, Ed Greer, you just uh, he just made his Comedy Central debut on the new Negro show. Him and I talk in Justice League. All your favorite Screen Junkies people, all your favorite Collider people. I had the uh, opportunity to talk to all of them, and they're going to keep coming on, so keep listening. Thank you very much, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.